Hi, welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be looking at three parts for our project positioning hammer, our introductory project, basic lathe techniques. And the three parts we're going to be looking at are the three smallest parts of the project that all start off at about the same size. So we have part number one, which is the plug that inserts into the handle. And we have part three and four, which are the striking surfaces that mount on the ends of the hammer head. So let's start with part number one, the plug. Now, this plug's material is cold rolled steel or mild steel. And if we look on the blueprint, we'll see that its rough dimensions at this point should be 19.5 millimeters in diameter and about 24 millimeters in length. However, if we look at the dimensions of the finished part, we'll notice that it should at the end measure 19 millimeters in length and 19 millimeters on its major diameter, but that a large portion of the part has its diameter reduced to 12 millimeters. We also notice that the 12 millimeter diameter is indicated with two numbers after the decimal point. And if we look in the cartouche at the tolerances, we'll notice that two decimals after the point indicates that this diameter has to be quite accurate. So I've installed my three jaw chuck and I have a tool installed, oriented properly and at proper height for a surfacing operation. I am going to surface one end of this part to give myself a reference surface lengthwise, a surface from which I can describe my different lengths. However, it's important to note here that for this part, our first surfacing operation is not going to be followed by a second surface operation to bring the part to its final length. This part is going to be hard to hold. So we're going to want to let all the material we can leave at the other end on so that we can have something to hold while we're turning our famous or infamous 12 millimeter diameter. So let's install the part in the chuck. However, be careful, all we're doing here is surfacing. So I'm going to install my part deeply into the three jaw chuck. I'm going to let just a small part of this piece stick out from the end of the jaws. Remember our two basic rules for holding parts in three jaw chucks. But since we're surfacing, and that's a bi-dimensional operation, we're not worried about concentricity here. Well, I can stick it in as deep as possible. All I need is just a little access to the end for my surfacing. I'm ready to surface, but just before we do, I think it's important to say that our rotation speed, or RPM here, is the same as we used for the hammer handle when we surfaced it. We're using the same material, and it's the same size, and we're using the same tool. So around four or 500 RPM will do just fine. As far as automatic feed goes, I encourage you not to use it in this case. Remember, we're just starting out here, and our tool is very close to the jaws of this three-jaw chuck. If I get confused about the direction I'm feeding into, I'm gonna get into trouble. So manual feeding for this part here, probably the best way to go. So let's do it.
So now that I have my reference surface, I can move over to the surface plate and lay out the position of my shoulder, the position of the chamfer, as well as the overall length of the part. So the shoulder at 13 millimeters, the chamfer at 17 millimeters, and finally the overall length at 19 millimeters. Now I've removed the three jaw chuck and replaced it with the C5 collet chuck holder because we're going to be using C5 collets for the rest of this part. Now the C5 collet holds a small part much more positively. It offers a larger contact surface between the gripping surfaces and the part. And since we're not going to be holding this part by very much material, well, it would be good to increase that surface of contact. So let's insert the C5 in the collet chuck, line it up, and thread it in. Before it gets snug down, let's insert our part that we've laid out so that I just see the line that indicates the length of the 12 millimeter diameter that I have to turn. Remember, the unfinished end of the part goes in the collet at this point because we want to turn that 12 millimeter diameter on the same end that we surfaced previously. Now, I'll reinstall my tool and orient it for some parallel turning. Now, we've seen how to turn an accurate diameter up to a shoulder when we looked at the hammer handle. So we're not going to pass through all that again. But there is one difference here. This diameter has to be very accurate. What I'm shooting for is just slightly bigger than 12 millimeters because this is going to become a light press fit in the handle that I reamed out to 12 millimeters. So what I'm looking for here is 12.01 or 12.02 millimeters. Now 0.01 or 0.02 millimeters that's pretty small. And to see that properly, we're going to have to use a micrometer instead of our vernier calipers. And we're going to have to approach it slowly because we really don't want to miss this dimension. It's important not to forget, as I just have, to reposition your tool from a servicing position to a shoulder turning position. So about five degrees clearance on each face of this cutting tool so we can work it into the corner that we have to produce. I should be getting pretty close to my 12 millimeters, so now would be the right time to start to measure a little more accurately and a little more often. Twelve point zero six. So I'm getting pretty close. A very light cut is all I need to do here, uh, and to make sure that I don't overcut and make the part too small. I'm going to come and cut just at the very beginning of my diameter, remeasure to make sure that I'm at my 12.02 and then complete the cut. After that and only once I get my diameter final, I'm going to come and plunge in on the shoulder to finish that edge.
Okay, so I'm at what I believe to be the final diameter on a very short length at the end of the part. So I'm going to measure that. There, okay. So 12.02 and some air. So we'll call that 12.02 millimeters. Now I can finish the rest of my diameter. I'm going to take advantage here of the fact that I'm well positioned to produce a little chamfer on the end of my 12 millimeter diameter. This is not an accurate chamfer, it's just going to be done by eye because it's just there to help me assemble my press fit later on. And there's our small chamfer. And there you go. Our 12 millimeter diameter and our 13 millimeter shoulder are complete. We can now reverse the part in the collet chuck, but be careful. We need to use a 12 millimeter collet now, not the three quarter one we've been using. So now we can change our three quarters of an inch C5 collet for a 12 millimeter C5 collet. Before it snugs in, I'll insert my part, but be careful. We want to hold it by as long a length as possible, but we don't want the corner to bottom out. There is a radius in that corner that we don't want touching the collet and interfering with the proper positioning of the part. Now I'm ready to surface the second end of the part and bring the part to its final dimension lengthwise. Remember, We've already laid out the line at 19 millimeters, which is the final length of the part. And we've already laid out a line at 18 millimeters to show us where that end chamfer should be. So we're going to surface this just to that scribe or laid out line. Because the overall length of this part, if we look at our blueprint, really isn't that accurate. So surfacing to the line will do just fine in this case. We're getting really close. One more small cut and it's done. Okay, so my 19 millimeter length is complete. But remember, we'd scribed a line at 17 millimeters to produce a chamfer. Now this chamfer is just aesthetic. So we're just going to produce it with a file. So let's get on to that chamfer. There you go. This part is complete. So I'm in low gear so I can undo my chuck. So let's just pull on the hand wheel here and get the part out. 
and move on to our next parts. We can now move on to the hammerhead's tips or the striking surfaces and there's two of them. They are dimensionally identical. We're talking about parts three and four here on our blueprint. So they're the same size, but there's one major difference between them, and that is their material. One is made of tool steel, it's going to be hardened and tempered, and the other one is made of brass. Now the fact that they are the same but different is going to entail a different approach. And what changes most here between a machining tool steel and machining brass is the cutting speeds and the feeds that we're going to use. Obviously, we're going to cut the tool steel a lot slower than we'll cut the brass. To give us an idea of what we're looking at speed-wise, we can say that our brass has a cutting speed of about 200 to 300 feet per minute. And that'll mean that we're going to be turning here somewhere around 8 or 900 RPM for our general turning operations on a piece of brass of this size. Whereas our tool steel here has a cutting speed of about 50 feet per minute. And that means that for this part, we're going to be cutting no more than 150 RPM, maybe 200 if things are really going well, but more likely 100 to 150. So you can see a big difference in the speed here. In reality, these two materials are at each end of the scale as far as ease or hardness to cut goes. And what we've cut up to now, the handle and the head itself, that were in mild steel, well they'd be somewhere in the middle, right between the two as far as hardness goes and ease of cutting. But it's not just the RPM that changes here, the feed changes as well. Now, for our brass, we can feed quite aggressively. And with that high RPM, we'll still get a nice finish and our tool will hold up. Whereas our tool steel is going to require a slow and gradual feed, just fast enough to keep a nice chip going. Any faster, and we're running the risk of breaking the end of the tool off. So, really, take your tool steel nice and easy. So, let's start with our brass tip. Now, I reinstalled the three-jaw chuck because the three-jaw chuck is all I need for these two last parts. It'll work just fine. I'm going to reinstall my part in the three-jaw chuck, putting it deeply into the chuck because this first operation is just a servicing operation and I don't have to turn the outside of this part because the outside diameter is already within the tolerance or the specs on the blueprint. So let's install it in the three-jaw chuck and surface the end of this part. Now that I've surfaced the end, I'm going to back my tool off quite a ways. Because before I take the part out of the chuck, I'm going to center drill and drill an 8.5 millimeter hole that I will tap to M10 by 1.5. So to tap M10 by 1.5 thread, we need an 8.5 millimeter hole. And we're going to drill that after having center drill. The center drill here is used to guide the 8.5 drill on center. So, let's set up for that.
So we can now install our 8.5 millimeter drill and drill our 8.5 millimeter hole. Now our blueprint indicates that we want 14 millimeters of threads. Now to get 14 millimeters of thread we're going to have to drill a little deeper. In this case we're going to want to go about 2 millimeters deeper. So for us we're going to want to shoot for about 17, 17 and a half millimeters on the tip of the drill. And in order to ensure that we don't go past that 17, 17 and a half, we're going to use our vernier caliper and measure regularly. Because our part only measures 19 millimeters overall, we don't want to blast through the end of the part. So we're at about 15.4 millimeters. We're going to have to go a little deeper. Okay, so 17.2 millimeters. Just great for what we're doing. Now that the hole has been drilled, we can tap it, and for that, we're going to use a taper tap, an M10 by 1.5, because that's the dimension of the thread indicated on the drawing. And I'm going to use the tailstock to keep it well aligned with the axis of my hole. We don't need the tap to be terribly tight, so just snug it down in the drill chuck. We can bring the tap up close to the part and make sure that the safety stop button is activated because the last thing I want here is for the machine to start while I'm manually tapping and set the spindle to neutral so that it can turn freely. I can now push the unlocked tailstock towards the part and engage the tool into the hole. Manually turn the chuck while I keep a light pressure on the tailstock and start the threading operation. Once that's done, two or three turns, I stop everything there because the rest will be done by hand. Now that the tool is well engaged into the part, I can undo the drill chuck and back the tailstock off and expose at the same time the tool. I can now set my spindle to a low gear so that it doesn't turn easily. I leave the emergency stop button engaged. We do not want to turn the machine on at this stage and using my tap handle I can complete the thread. Now, be careful. We have here a taper tap that is pointy on its end. Many taper taps are. And if we bottom it out with force, especially in this soft brass, we will deform the bottom of the hole. So just snug this first tap to the bottom. We'll be using a plug and ultimately a bottoming tap to complete the thread right to the bottom. And those taps aren't pointy. So as soon as I feel a light resistance, I'm going to back this tool off and because this material is quite soft and easy to tap, I'm going to jump over the plug tap and move right on to the bottoming. Since it's almost flat on its tip, the bottoming tap is going to give me a thread almost to the end of the hole.
I'm feeling a good resistance here. I've bottomed out so I can back the tool off. This threading operation is complete. There you go. A small chamfer completes this end of the part. Now I can lay out one line at 17 millimeters for my chamfer and a second line at 19 millimeters for my overall length. So let's head back to the lathe, surface my second end to its final length and produce my chamfer. is done. So I can extract the part and move on to the tool steel end. Now remember, everything with this tip is going to happen a lot slower.